Thank you all for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Today's talk is our unity is in our divinity. The core of that statement finds its meaning in the true understanding of who you really are. And I'm going to put on the table three different perspectives on who you are. And you're all very familiar with the first two, and those will go fairly quickly. So, for the first perspective on who you are, we have our scientists, and I love science, and they offer us this idea that you are your body and your mind. And they also tell us that your consciousness arises from your body and your mind and the biochemistry of your body and your mind. They have a beautiful phrase for this. They call your consciousness an emergent property. And I think that's beautiful. Now what this understanding does for them is it brings them a practical understanding, a way for them to deal with the world that's around them. But I don't think that's the whole story. So that brings us to the second understanding of who you are. And this understanding holds that you are your soul, which is associating with your body. When I was a very little boy, two years old, three years old, I had an intuitive understanding that there was more to me than my body. I just knew that. I didn't articulate it very well because I was just a little boy. But that intuitive understanding was already there, and it might have been there for you too. And by the time I started Catholic school and they started to teach me about the soul, I was already there. Got it, you know? Now, I didn't stay Catholic that long. I left when I was about 20. And I still had an understanding that there was a God that I was a soul. And eventually, after a while, I read some of these books. Perhaps you've read them too. Books about near-death experience, out-of-body experiences, past lives, and things like that. And what I was doing as a hobby, I was generating a cognitive understanding of myself as a soul that was associated with the body. And this cognitive understanding was helping the intuitive understanding. There was a greater opening for a deeper intuitive understanding. And as this cognitive understanding developed, the intuitive understanding developed and helped me also put it into words better. Yeah. So these two things, the cognitive understanding and the intuitive understanding, are like two hands that work together, one washing. And this is where I am today, in many ways. And yet there's more. But there is even more, perhaps, for some of you right here, right now, that you also have an experiential understanding. If you've had a conscious out-of-body experience, then you know from that experience that without a doubt, the first perspective I put on the table is incomplete. I like to say incomplete rather than wrong. Some people would say that it's wrong because it's incomplete. But I'm fine with just saying that that first perspective is just incomplete. And if you've had these conscious experiences, including conscious memory of past lives, you have even more of an understanding of this soul-body connection. And yet, I'm comfortable with my understanding, with this cognitive understanding and this intuitive understanding. And now I'd like to put on the table the third perspective. I'd like to offer it for your consideration. This also comes from intuitive understanding. This perspective offers that you are fundamentally, and by that word I mean, stripped of everything that's not essential. What you have is pure awareness. 
by this phrase, pure awareness. Well, I'm using the word awareness to mean exactly what you think it means. The ability to perceive, the power of perception. Why do I call it pure awareness? I call it pure awareness because this awareness has no thing-like qualities. It is not an object or a thing that you can perceive. <clears throat> the ancient texts refer to it this way. They call this pure awareness the unseen seer of seeing, the unheard hearer of hearing, the unfelt feeler of feelings. And this is an intuitive understanding that comes to you. This intuitive understanding about this awareness arises usually in three steps, some of them coming right on top of each other, some coming years or lifetimes apart. The three understandings are this, the first that I just put on the table, the sudden recognition that I am not fundamentally a soul. Yes, I am a soul, and yet this is a construction. But fundamentally, I am pure awareness. That's the first understanding. The second intuitive understanding that arises is, ah, the awareness that's looking out of my eyes is the same awareness that's looking out of everyone's eyes. There is only one awareness. We use this word one to underline the idea of wholeness. I already mentioned that this awareness is not an object, so it can't be counted like you might look around the room and see an object like this piano and count. There is one piano. This one awareness is referred to as one because it is always whole. It never breaks into pieces, whether those pieces are separate pieces or pieces that are somehow connected. This one awareness is always whole. This one awareness never branches out like the branches on a tree where there's the one awareness and your awareness and his awareness and her awareness and so forth. This awareness is always one. And this is who you are. The third awakening about this awareness is that this awareness gives birth to everything that it is aware of. What we're talking about here is God and creation. Now, of course, God and creation is a mystery. And I am not here to explain the mystery. I'm here to encourage us all to stand in wonder and awe of the mystery of creation. How does God arise as all of creation? And in this point, I'd like to bring in the scientist. This is very easy, don't worry. I love science. Scientists often talk about time, space, energy, and matter. And while they cannot tell you fully what time really is, they can measure it and put it in an equation. They cannot tell you what space really is, but they can measure it and put it in an equation. And similar things can be said about energy and matter. And when they do this, they come up with equations, which are descriptions, little tiny descriptions, about the wonderful, miraculous world all around us. The best scientists stand and admit that they are in wonder and awe about the miracle that's all around us. And yet they offer and receive this sliver of practicality a little bit about what, but not so much about how or why. A little bit about what, a description compared to a full explanation. And this is what I'd like to say I offer with this miracle of God and creation. I cannot say why. Why would God create the world the way that it is? I don't know. I have no words for that. 
How does God arise as each and every one? I don't know. But I can say a little bit, just a little bit about the what. I offer a little description. And in this, an ancient metaphor has been used about the actor and the character. So let's take God and creation and put them aside for a moment. This is meant to be a joke. You cannot put God and creation aside. But let's just pretend we're looking at Hollywood and an actor or an actress coming forward as a character. We clearly see, without a doubt, the actor is the source of the character. It's not the other way around. The character is not the source of the actor. The character cannot go on the stage without the actor. And yet the actor can drop the role of the character, and the actor will continue to be the actor. When the actor brings forth the character, every single quality or aspect of the character is truly a quality or aspect that the actor is choosing to put on display. The character is not the source of any of its qualities or aspects. The character is completely dependent upon this transcendent source actor. And because of this, it is very wise to make a distinction between the actor and the character. And yet, let's continue. We notice that when the actor comes forth as the character, the actor is fully saturating, permeating this character. It's more than like a person getting in a car and driving it around. It would be closer if the person got in the car and could somehow infuse themselves in every single atom of the car. That would be closer. But you see that this actor is fully saturating this character. If you want to find the actor, you do not need to dig into the character one level and then a deeper level and then another level. The actor is present at every level. When you look directly into the eyes of the character, you're looking directly into the eyes of the actor. And because of this, we say that when the actor brings forth the character, they are one. So which is it? Are they one or are they two? It's both depending upon the perspective we wish to speak from. Now, this second perspective that we offered, there's a beautiful saying about it, the perspective that you are a soul. You've heard it many times, and I'm going to expand a little bit on it. So here it is. You are not a human being having a spiritual experience. You are a spiritual being having a human experience. And while this understanding is deep and profound and beautiful, I would like to offer, perhaps for you, something even deeper. What I am suggesting is that you are not a being of any kind. You are not a physical being or a spiritual being. You are pure awareness. This is the divine awareness. This awareness exists before time and outside of space. This pure awareness, this source awareness, the divine source, is you. And this awareness is looking out of your eyes right now. Let's go back to this actor character metaphor a little bit. Let's suppose that the character is a fireman and that the scene is a house that's on fire and there's someone inside that needs to be saved. 
Notice that the character cannot push back against the actor. The character has no will and power of its own. The apparent will and power of the character is truly the will and power of the actor. The character cannot push back. It cannot say to the actor, whoa, that looks really dangerous. Uh, you know what? That looks so dangerous, I'm not going to do it. I mean, you can go if you want, but I'm not going. In fact, I noticed another set over there, and there's a much more romantic scene going on over there. So I'm going over there, you can do what you want. The character can't do that. The character has no will and power to do this. And when we look at the character on the stage, is there really a fireman? No, no. There's just an actor pretending to be a fireman. And no matter how good that pretending is, you can still only always be what you are. There's another saying that's very popular. We are all one. This is a puzzling statement for many people, especially the people just walking down the sidewalk. One reason why it's puzzling, of course, is the core message of it is quite baffling. But there's also the fact that it speaks from two different perspectives. It speaks from one perspective from the first part, and the second part is from another perspective. And it doesn't hint that it's going to change perspectives. So what I would like to do is expand this little saying so that there's a bit of a hint about where it's coming from. I like to say, in form, meaning in creation, in form, we are many. In essence, we are one. And all of it is divine. Creation and source are fully divine. Creation, of course, is always changing. And from a practical perspective, it's perfectly valid to say that it's improving using the standards of our ordinary world. And yet, it's always fully divine. And of course, this transcendent reality, the fundamental principle of reality, this source awareness that you are and have always been is, of course, fully divine. And this is why I say our unity is in our divinity. Thank you so much. <laughs>